Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. Today we're going to look at creating a class to represent our application logic. This is the last video, by the way, before we get into the actual Direct 3D topics. Uh, so first off, why do we need this app class? What does it do for us? Let's take a look at some code from when we were testing our uh, previous features. So, when we do a test in WinMain, we generally put some uh, test logic directly into our message pump loop here. And uh, I mean, that's, that's fine for what it is here, but when you create a big, you know, a, a decent sized game, you're gonna have a lot of logic and it's kind of messy to jam it all in here in this loop. We like to keep that separate. We like to keep that more organized. So the basic idea, what we want to do here, we're looking at a very basic architecture like this. We've got a game object and that will own one or more windows and the logic in the game object is going to refer and interface with the th things of the window, the components, the keyboard, the mouse, the graphics, uh, and it's also going to store the, uh, the, com the entities of the game and so on and so forth. So this is going to be a little better organization for us. So in this commit here, we add a basic app class, uh, app.h. There's not much to it. It's got a constructor, it's got a single function called go, and then a private function called do frame. So the logic for every frame will be put in the do frame function. Go will be called when the application starts to basically start the game loop. And we know that the app is gonna own a window, uh, an app.cpp. For creating the app, we create the window. And go, we're basically gonna put our message pump logic into the go function here. And then do frame is basically gonna contain the top level of our game logic, which is currently empty. And then in winmain.cpp, now instead of putting all that message pump logic in here, we just create an app and we call go on it immediately just temporary doesn't matter because go is going to be looping until the end of the application and then it's just going to uh, give the return value the exit code which will then be returned from here and if it throws an exception at any point that'll be caught and reported now the next thing I want to do here is I want to demonstrate a problem that our message pump has had basically since the beginning uh, in order to do that we need a timer here we need to deal with some uh, time elapsement is that a word? Sure. So, the Chili Timer class, it's um, basically the timer from the C++ series, for those of you coming in from there. Uh, very, it's just a basic wrapper around std chrono, not that complicated if you know C++. Um, but to make a long story short, you call mark, and it will give you the time elapsed since the last time you called mark. Uh, and calling peak will give you the time elapsed since the last time you called mark without resetting the mark point. It's fairly simple. It's not that difficult. You just look at the code, see how it works. But what we're going to do with this is we, in app.h, we're going to add a timer to our window. And then in app.cpp, in the do frame, we are going to peak the current time since the timer was created. And then we're going to display that on to the window title so that we should get an uh, an increasing count of time in seconds here let's run and see what we get so here's our window and you can see our time elapsed is being shown here now watch what happens when i stop moving the mouse the time elapsed isn't being updated anymore if i move the mouse you'll see it jumps immediately to 14 seconds so why is it only drawing, why is it only updating the elapsed time when I move the mouse? Well, the answer basically comes down to the way that um, get message works. So let's go to, where is it? Here in app.go, we have a while loop, we call get message, and then we process the message. But what happens when there's no message in the message loop? Well, get message will block and wait for a message to come in. It'll put your application to sleep until a message comes in. And again, this makes a lot of sense if you think about the way a typical Windows application works. An event-driven application should be sleeping when there is no input, when nothing is happening. It shouldn't be consuming CPU cycles. 
and that's what this does. So we're not going to get an update on our uh, on our time count until we get some messages and that's a problem for a game right because even if you're not doing any input you want your game to keep running you don't want it to pause every time the user isn't doing anything on the keyboard or the mouse or the controller or whatever so clearly here get message is not going to cut the mustard so what is going to cut the mustard well, the boys at Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, they've thought of everything and they've given us the peak message function. It, this can do a number of different things. One thing it can do is it can peak a message, funny enough, which means that you can copy a message from the message queue without actually removing it. Leave it in the queue, but just copy it out and see what it is. Uh, but that's not what we want to do. But there's another thing it can do. What it can do is it can try to get a message, but if there is no message, it'll return immediately. And that's what we do want to do. So, peak message works quite similar to get message. You can see here a lot of similar parameters. Uh, but there is one here that is new, w remove message. And this tells you basically the way that peak message is going to work. Uh, so you can peak message no remove, which is what I told you before. It, peaks it but it leaves it in the queue you can peak message remove you can peak message no yield this one here is a little complicated but luckily we don't need to worry about it all we need to worry about here is peak message remove because we want to call peak message we want it to remove from the queue like get message does but we want it to we want to call peak message because it'll return immediately if there is no message um, there's also other things that you can or into this uint um, you can add these flags here and this will tell it you know what kind of messages it should process so it's kind of like an additional filtering uh, ability beyond just filtering by id here now the second major difference between get message is in the return value so this returns a bool uh, but this bool signals whether a message is available so if the return value is non-zero that means it pulled a message or it copied a message out um, but if the return value is zero that means there was no message and it just returned uh, so you need to check this to see whether there is a message to process it says nothing here about uh, if there was an error so get message signals errors in its return value. This one doesn't signal, signal errors. So we're not going to try to process errors on peak message, although there's probably a way to do it. It's not that big of a deal. But we, let's see what we are going to do. We're going to move the message processing logic from the app uh, go function into a static function on window. Uh, it's static because process messages should process messages for all windows not just a single one so that's why we make it static and uh, we're going to use a little c++ i think 17 cool stuffs here called optional and this will allow us to optionally return an int we return an int or we can just return an empty optional uh, and that'll be a good signal for whoever calls process messages to know what happened so in process messages what we're going to do is basically it's the same message pump but different uh, so here we're going to be processing while peak message returns true returns non-zero that means that there was a message in the queue and we should process that message first we check to see if it's a quit message remember the old version the old um, get message its return value signaled whether it was a quit message this one's return value signals whether there was a message at all so we need to actually check that message manually to see whether it was quit and if so we return the w param uh, and that will construct an optional with the w param and return that uh, if it was not quit then we just process as usual translate and dispatch and then keep doing that until there are no messages left in the queue when there are no messages left then we return an empty optional and then in app.cpp things become a lot simpler uh, now all we do is in our go function we have an infinite loop and we call process messages the result goes into ecode and ecode is an optional so optional overloads the boolean operator and it returns true it evaluates to true if the optional has a value so if it has a value 
that means that we had an exit code, we had a WM quit, and we should just return that exit code. If it doesn't have a value, then we call do frame and we do a frame of our game logic. And then we go back up and we do it all again until this one returns a field optional, in which case we return that exit code. Pretty simple, pretty sexy with the use of uh, C++ 17's optional. I like it. And if we run this, we now see that our window is updating the elapsed time regardless of whether we move our mouse or not, doesn't matter. It's always gonna be updating that motherfucker. And that is beautiful. And that's it, that's our app system. That is our enhanced message loop. And um, that's basically it. The other, the other thing I did here, just some small tweaks, you can look at that yourself, it's not very important. But that's gonna be the end of this video. And in the next video, we are going to actually start tackling Direct 3D itself. We've got all of our Windows groundwork laid and we are ready to build on top of that our Direct 3D hardware accelerated goodness. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D. Mm -hmm.